got your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7, we'll read from uh, verse 11 uh, all the way through to 8 verse 6 this morning. As, as we come to, to uh, today's text, you're going you're to see a lot of jargon about the temple, about Melchizedek, about priesthood. And, and one of the temptations, especially in evangelical Christianity, uh, because of our, our poor engagement with the Old Testament, we kind of think that it's the start of the faith. We think that, you know, it's, it's okay. We just, we, those, are the, those are the ancient things. We're now in grace, so we don't have to consider it. And we get to a, a dangerous place where, where recently a pastor in the United States preached and says, we know the, the Old Testament has some complicated and offensive things to say. We can put that aside because we have the new. And the problem is we can't. Because our faith is not simply 2,000 years old. Our faith is rooted in the Jewish faith. And in fact, it precedes even the Jews themselves to Abraham and all the way through to, to the first human beings, Adam and Eve. It's an ancient reality. And so what the temptation is going to be today is you're going to read through this and think... This is for Jewish Christians. It doesn't apply to me. I know about the gospel. I know about Jesus. And I want to just say, no, be careful. This is a crisis, what we are going to in encounter today. It's a temptation that is common to the whole of humanity. And so that's what we're going to unpack. So let's read together. It is a long text, but this is God's word. Let it wash over us this morning. And let God speak this morning as we read it. Hebrews 7 verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and if indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belongs to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are for a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulations are set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. A better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others become priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of, these, of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heaven. Unlike, uh, unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifice day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of other people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made priest forever. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human hands. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth... He would not be a priest, for there are already priests 
who offer these sacrifices, uh, sorry, these gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary. That is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But in, the, in, in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, the teacher in me desperately wants to explain all the nitty gritties and why it's mentioned tabernacle here and not temple and go into the woods. But I'm going to lose you. And on some level, it's, it's not necessary. I want, to, I want to argue for this morning the theme of what has been described here, this, this Jewish problem that is applied to us. And as I started, it, although this is written to Jewish Christians, the temptation of this text is as prevalent for us today in the 21st century, Gentile as we are, as it was for them Jewish Christians. And here is the temptation. There is set up only two approaches to God. There's only two possible ways to get to a divinity. One is on self-merit. And the other is on given merit, what Martin Luther would call an alien merit, a merit that is granted to us. And this is why the writer of the Hebrews sets up the contrast between the Levitical system and the system of Jesus. And this leads us to our first point this morning, which is the two laws. I mean, it's a complicated text. Let's just uh, settle with that. But what has been described is that there are two parts Two parts only. One is self-merit and the other is given merit. Now the temptation for us is always the self-merited path. In a sense, church, our deep desire is always that we want to make ourselves. We want to prove ourselves in the world that we live in, don't we? We want to make something of ourselves. I mean, from knee high to a grasshopper, you know, when we're tiny, we want to be able to show that we are worthy. And so we spend our lives driving after this. And in fact, I'm going to say this morning, I think this desire to do, to prove, to be good is actually a God-given instinct. Work, I hate to break it to you, work is not a result of the fall. You are made to produce. You're made to do. You're made to actually do good. What was the command that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden? Be fruitful and multiply. Tend the garden. And rule over the earth. Extend the borders of Eden to the whole of the cosmos. Bring order out of chaos. That's our instinct. We want to do that. Sin has made our work frustrating. And more than that, sin has corrupted our very desires of of work and of doing and of proving so that we make them a sense of our being. In other words, it's no longer to just be good at your job. You identify yourself as what you do. I'm a pastor. So that means like I need to be certain levels of things, right? I need to prove myself in that. And that's what robs us of our sense of meaning in our work. Because what happens when you identify yourself in what you do? You become a slave of that thing. That's the corruption. I am only worthy if I fill in the blank. Teach well. Produce well, you know, account well. I don't know, I'm not an accountant. (laughs) You see, it's corrupted in us. And the argument of the writer of the book of Hebrews is trying to show us that this corruption has made all the laws, all the self-provings, the crisis. 
And so there exist two laws at work in the world. One is of self-justification and the other one is of given justification. One is go out and do, go out and prove, go out and achieve, go out and make something of yourself. And guess what? It's endless. It's endless. In fact, the crisis of most young people is you get caught up in a cycle of very quick achievements. I don't know if you've noticed this. You get out of school and it's like straight into the next thing. Uh, either you go get a job or you go get college and this, you know, then marriage and then, you know, first job. And you just constantly promotion, have kids, then they go to school. It's this constant one up, right? It's almost like those mobile games that they've given, you know, if you ever get sucked in, suck it into them, it's because it's actually designed to suck you in. What happens in a mobile game? It's, it's stupid, pointless little victories, is it not? Uh, you know, the Candy Crush. If you get the right kind of combination of things, is that way old? I think that's dead long ago. You get the right combination of things, and you win a thousand things. I mean, it's a thousand of whatever. And you're like, yes, now I've got to go for 2,000. I won't share... Uh, the, you know, the, 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 you know, wherever that goes. We, we get these false rewards, right? Isn't that life? Although the rewards aren't false. You get rewards. And these rewards tell us what? I'm okay. Until we suddenly wake up in our middle life and realize we have hit the peak. There's no more rewards. And I still don't feel okay. One of the weirdest things uh, that's happened to me recently is, and there's a long story to this, but uh, uh, I won't say that my wife said I must burn my matric results because they're so embarrassing, but my wife said I must burn my matric results because they're so embarrassing. Um, I've had a constant sense of trying to prove that I'm smart enough. That is my struggle. That, you know, that I, that I can hold my own because I was an idiot in school, and that's just the, the I was dumb. I, I, I ran by the adage that 50 is a pass, 51%, you're, you're failing your friends, you know? <laughs> and so, throughout my studies, I've always felt like I'm just not there. And the dream was, once that title is given, once you're a doctor, suddenly there's going to be a magic switch, that you'll be clever, you know? You'll know everything. And I graduated and that didn't happen. Still as insecure as when I was in my program. Still as confused. Still trying to prove. This is what happens to us. We move through life and there's a constant sense of, if I just get, if I just prove, if I just do, I will be what? Okay. And what happens at every journey, at every point, at every stop? Bringing it home. Many people in our country are convinced if we just change the government, we'll be okay. You know what they're going to discover? Even if we do change the government, that South Africa is filled with sins. In other words, we're going to wake up tomorrow reeling because nothing's really changed. The next sense of okayness will need to be pursued. See, church, what has really been offered here is only two things, but it's effectively the, the same thing, is salvation. The world offers a salvation. It does. It offers a sense of wellness of being. This is in career, this is in goodness, this is in your hope, securities, in achievements, in a future. Isn't that all the promises? The question is, does it work? I want to show you this morning, we actually we long for the salvation. This is what we deeply are longing for. In fact, this leads us to our second point, which is the two paths. There are only two possible ways of salvation. One is proving yourself, as I've spoken about, self-justification. Do what is required. Figure it out. Do what you need to do. Make something of yourself. 
The writer of the Hebrews identifies this with the temptation of the Jewish Christians, which is going back to the law. There I can prove myself. If I just go back to the law, at least I've got something to cling to, to say, I've done what's required, so I'm okay. But the question is, and this is the question of every point of self-justification, which is, how much is enough? Like, really, how much is enough? How rich is rich enough? How successful is successful enough? How safe is safe enough? How guaranteed is guaranteed enough? I've been listening to a podcast recently, um, and it was, it's a historical podcast. It was just before COVID hit, and it was amusing because you hear all these conversations and plans that people had for the year 2020, and like there was this gleeful, like almost like an evil, like, oh, you guys have no idea what's in store. <laughs> But that's what we do. We're like, you know, this year is going to be the best. You know, this has got these plans. We've got that. And then out of nowhere, what happens? I think this is the crisis of the modern age. We had most of our hopes shattered in a very short couple of years. This is the problem of self-justification. It's the life of proven salvation is one of endless toil. It's a never-ending proving In fact, it's like, it's like if I just get over this next hill, I'll be okay. And what happens at that next hill? It's not just another hill, is it? It's a valley of hills. Until you want to give up. And, you know, most men at that point buy a motorcycle and try and ride away, you know, or like a sports car. <laughs> most women, I think, just force their kids to have grandkids. Eh? Is that how? <laughs> um, the, the next hill, is it not? Hey, the next hill, the next hill. And it leaves us empty, it does. It leaves us robbed of life. It leaves us hopeless. And that leaves us only one other option, which is to live in received okayness. Now, I know that's not an English word, but received salvation. That is given to us, no matter who we are, no matter what we have done, no matter what opposes us, We are okay because someone has said it. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be loved and appreciated because of what you can do or because of who you are? I'm sure I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. Men, if your lady sends you a message and says, why do I love you? It is a trap. Because you're going to run through and it's like, because you're the most beautiful woman in the whole room, the whole wide room, no, the world. And what is the next thing they're going to say? Would you still love me if I was a worm? (laughs) That's the meme. I don't know why it's a worm, but that's the meme. You know, what what if I got ugly? What if I get fat? See, that's a trap. But what are they asking? It's a good instinct. Will you love me for me? Do you love me because I'm just me, not because of what I can do? We don't want to be loved because of what we can achieve and what we can bring and what we can produce. We want to be loved because we are. And yet, isn't that exactly what's offered to us in the gospel? The gospel comes to us where? In our brilliance? In our genius? In what we have set up as our hope? No, it comes to us in our mess. In our worst. It comes to us as God came to Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? Like God didn't know. I hid because I was naked and ashamed. That's where God called us, in our nakedness, in our shame. But not to keep us there, but to call us to be with Him. And in that that calling, what does He say? He says, I love you. You're okay. But not to stay as you are. But to come something more. Not on your own effort. 
but on the effort of someone else. And this is the beauty of what's offered. And notice the writer is presenting this in in a, a complicated but beautiful way. On the one side, we have the Levitical code with all its drudgery, with all its laws, with all its constant sacrifices. And why is there a constant sacrifice? Because the people representing it are sinful. On the other hand, we have someone who's perfect, a priest who's perfect, who has no need for sacrifice. And yet, what does he do? He dies. See, Jesus never never needed to atone for himself. However, once for all time, church, he atoned himself. Well, he offered himself, sorry, for who? For us. The sacrifice was him. And he gave that for who? For you. In your sin, in your brokenness, in your crisis. Now this leaves a a question. If this is offered to us, if this is given to us in such beauty and such wonder, how do we live there? How do we live in that reality? And this leads us to the third point, which is the just shall live by faith. See, the gospel presents us with a crisis. It presents us with a reality, actually a truth, that deep down you know is true, which is that you don't have what it takes. You are not as perfect as you want the world to see. You're shattered, you're broken. The gospel offers us a sense of approval, though, and security that nothing in this world could ever offer us because it's in that brokenness that God comes to you and says what? I love you. And you are okay. In fact, it says something more. Have you thought about this? But the gospel comes to you in that crisis. I mean, Eddie, thank you for reading that this morning. That quote from Spurgeon. We sin constantly, but he never stops forgiving. The gospel comes to us in our sin, in our crisis, in our problems. And what does it say? It doesn't say, you know, you're rubbish, Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Pull yourself together. Try harder. Come on. No. It comes to us in our crisis and God says what? I love you. In fact, because of what Jesus has done for you, you are now my beloved. The one I long for. God longs for us in Jesus. Not who we could become, not what we could contribute, not what we could prove ourselves to be. God loves you as you are, but not to stay as you are. In fact, what's offered in it is so much more, we can't even get our minds around it. Jesus becomes the energy of what we are going to become. It's given to us again. He becomes the catalyst. He becomes the reality. He becomes our okayness in the world. In fact, let me just throw this out there this morning. What would happen to you if you knew tomorrow, waking up, that everything, and I mean everything in life, would just be okay? That that it's just going to be fine. That you're fine. That more than that, you're, you're loved. There's nothing more you can do. You're just, you are okay and loved and Just okay. How would that change tomorrow's outlook? Didn't have to go out. You didn't have to work to prove that. You didn't have to fill out those forms. You didn't have to, like, you know, deal with those brats. You're just okay. How would that change the way you see your life? It would make it a little bit livable, eh? It would make it actually a delight. But church, that's exactly what Christ has given us in the gospel. And yet I guarantee you, I guarantee you're going to wake up tomorrow and fall back into the pattern of what? I need to live up. 
come on, Barry, you need to do this. Get your life together. Stop messing up. Stop being such a loser. Maybe not tomorrow, but I guarantee you by then the week that's going to happen. <laughs> we pray God's grace it won't happen. Eh? So church, why do we constantly slip back into it? Why do we constantly slip back into the cycle of toil when what's offered is so obviously infinitely better? I think C.S. Lewis puts a bet when he said, it would seem to us our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures footing around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You know why? You're going to wake up tomorrow and by the time you're probably in the office or in the classroom or whatever you're doing, you're going to be stuck back in that cycle of toil. Do you know why you're going to do it? Because you're too easily pleased. Christ has offered you instantly available, infinite joy, infinite satisfaction, infinite approval. But you're far too easily pleased. It's this next thing that I need. And deep down we know it doesn't work. We know. But we are. We just... We chase after the wrong things. Church, you offered peace, infinite joy, perfect security. If you would simply stay in faith. If you depend upon yourself less and upon Jesus more. But you are too easily pleased. And so how do we live this? How do we stay in this? Well, the Bible offers us one way in. And one way to stay. The just shall live by faith. This is not a once-off event. I hope you've seen this. This is a daily struggle, is it not? In fact, I'm almost willing to say by the time you leave the church today, you will have to drink deeply again of the gospel. Someone's just going to look at you wrong. And you're going to think, if you're a lady, does these jeans make me look big, you know? <laughs> or if you're a man, that person thinks I'm small, you know? Like, something's going to come up, right? Did I do this well enough? Did I mess up that conversation? Did I offend that person? Church, the just shall live by faith. You need Jesus. You don't need him once. You need him every day. You need him all the time. You need him every moment. And I guarantee you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to, you're going to mess up. And you need the words of Christ saying, It's okay. I love you. I died for you. And you're still mine. You need the... The words of the one who says, I am faithful and just. I'll remember your sins no more. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Just think about this. You bring your, your crisis to Jesus. He's not storing it up for a later battle. You know, he's not like keeping secret knowledge so that one day when you sin again, he's like, you see, you did it again. What does he say? If you confess your sins to me as far as the east is from the west as I'll take them from you and I will remember them no more. New are his mercies every morning. Great is high faithfulness. Church, live by faith. Drink deeply of the gospel moment by moment. Live in what is offered to you. By Jesus. Let's pray.
Lord, as we come to the foot of your cross again, Holy Spirit, remind us, remind us, we need the reminder of the words you said on the cross. It is finished. Lord, I, I guess why we constantly drink of this is because we, it's too wonderful to believe. Why should the God of heaven and earth look upon us and delight in us? And the answer is he shouldn't. The answer is our sins deserve the condemnation that we feel. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, there is now no condemnation for us. So Lord, let, me, let us live in that Let's drink deeply of the wonder of the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world to, to die for sinners, of which I am chief. So we thank you. We love you. We want to bless your name this morning. Amen.